Uh, good morning, good afternoon, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Kerry Millsap. I'll, I can let you read the slide. I, um, uh, today, I'll be talking about some things that are that are spread out across uh, many of the papers and and articles and some of the the content that I that I've written in the book. So you can see on this slide some of the things that uh, that I've that I've done. And um, I know James will put up the contact information later, but basically you can see a sampling of all of it at method, methodr.com, spelled method-r.com. And I'm going to spend about uh, roughly 20 minutes at the beginning of the, the show here. And it begins really with the question, you know, the title is Real Developers Do Use Tools. So I feel like the right way to kick this off is to say, tools, why? And I think the most interesting way to approach this is through the, the vehicle of a story. So uh, here we go. Here's our story. Once upon a time, uh, there was a brand new program and a brand new software package and it was running just right. Uh, and you could know it was running just right too because it passed all of its functional regression tests. So now it was time for profiling. And you might ask, profiling? Why? Well, because putting code into production without profiling is irresponsible. Um, it's, it's really a big deal. Um, profiling your code is the act of seeing where the time is being spent within your code. I'm going to show you a Donald Knuth quote in a few minutes that, uh, that relates back to the very famous thing that he wrote back in 1970 or so that said uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And the the reason that uh, the Donald Knuth wrote that, and the reason I know the reason, is because he wrote a lot of paragraphs around that very famous statement that people t tend to not quote. And I'll show you show you part of that here shortly. But basically, what Knuth meant by saying that was that a lot of people optimize where they think their code is spending time, um, but but it's not really where their code is spending time. And the cost of optimizing something that isn't spending a lot of time, well, of course, when you optimize, it, it consumes uh, labor time that you could have spent creating a new feature or, or optimizing the things you really should have been optimizing. But worse than that, people, when they optimize code, tend to make the code less maintainable. They tend to start making compromises in, in readability. Um, and those compromises add up to make the, the code more expensive to maintain. It, it, those compromises add up to making the code have more bugs in it. And profiling is the way that you can stay out of many of those traps. And that's actually the, the, the very famous quote from Knuth, that premature optimization is the root of all evil. Um, it's really in a, in a context of Knuth advocating that people profile before they, they move their applications into production. And what I want to do is show you an example that, uh, that, that really follows from this, this introductory story. Um, the, the tool that you're looking at now is change names. You can see on, on this line, uh, let's see if you can see my mouse cursor, I guess yes. you can. Okay, I can't see it on my iPad. So can you see it over here, Ron? Or can you also see it when I'm over here? You can see it. Okay, excellent. So we used to have a program called LSTRC, which now is called uh, MRLS, Mr. LS. And the job of this thing is to show the, the interior contents of trace files and directories full of trace files in an ls command kind of way. So if you're on a Linux server, you know you can type ls minus l, for example, and see a long listing of, of the file names, the sizes of the files, the modification date on the files, the permissions on the files. Well, when we work with trace data, we want to see different attributes of the files. So we, we've written this uh, lstrc thing, which now is called Mr. LS which actually goes and reads some information out of the trace files and, and shows that on your command line. Well, it, it worked great, as I, as I said in my cutesy little story a couple slides ago. Um, and now it's time to profile. So the way that we profile the code written in Perl that we use, uh, the, the source code of, of LSTRC, is I use a very simple Perl profiler called dprof, which is uh, um, a very I'll call it a lightweight profiling tool. And there are lots of blog posts about whether dprof is the best profiler out there or not, but it's, it's a plenty good profiler, uh, for, this, for this case at least. So I ran Perl minus D dprof 
and then I ran the dprof pp command. Of course, in the, in the ellipsis up here, the regular output of lstrc came out. But the profile output is what I was really concerned about seeing. And this, this particular concern I had was about a function called reline in the module called file colon colon read backwards. And I was really worried that my code was probably spending a lot of time in this particular module. And I was, I was quite shocked to find out that actually only 1.72% of my time was in, in this uh, read line function. And 64.1% of my time was in this function called total CPU, which is a function that I had written and I knew exactly what it did. Well, the reason it was so shocking to me to see that 64% of my time was being spent in this total CPU function call is because I'm not even supposed to call the total CPU function unless I use the minus minus CPU option. And if I had used the minus minus CPU option, it would appear here in the blue square. I didn't specify that. So basically, I had a bug in my code. It, it still produced the right results, but by calling this total CPU function, it was causing my, uh, my program to actually read the entire context of every trace file in the directory from which I ran this command. And it's, it's an example of a filter late anti-pattern. Basically, I was um, getting tons of data from, from the files on the system, and I was only displaying a little bit of it. So it's a waste of the user's time. It's a waste of system capacity on the machine. And had we put this into production without profiling, it would have caused me actually fairly grave embarrassment as a developer to, to have subjected you know, hundreds of thousands of people who run this code later to my mistake. And the mistake was really easy. The, the debugging only took about 10 minutes. Well, actually, probably took 30 seconds. I'd missed a modifier. The, the total CPU function call in Perl had not been protected with the if statement that checked to see if I'd specify the, uh, the CPU option on the command line. So quite simply, all I had to do was add the text that's highlighted in green here, and I fixed my bug. So the net effect here is that my code was wasting 64% of the user's time when he ran this, ran this program. Um, it was easy to find and easy to fix, but I would have missed it completely if I hadn't profiled my code. And that's what Donald Knuth meant when he said this, or when he wrote this, the universal experience of programmers who have been using measurement tools to profile their code has been that their intuitive guesses about where that code spends its time fail. And that's why profiling is so important. Um, in general, and I want to talk about feedback for a little bit. In general, feedback is the basis for, I think, all improvement. And I had fun yesterday collecting, uh, collecting graphics to put on this slide. I'm uh, a bit of a, a, a tool guy. I've, I've got a workshop at my house in which I create uh, wood things and now some smaller metal things. And some of the most important tools that I own are tools that give me feedback about whether my processes are achieving the goals that I, that I ultimately want those processes to achieve. Kind of Along the top, you can see that here's a, a very expensive tool called the Eichner distometer. Um, here's, it, it measures the distance from this little point here to the, to the surface that this flat edge is referenced along. And it's a, it's a quite elegant little tool. Um, this height gauge here tells you how high this point is from a flat surface on which this base rests. This is called a stare at last word dial indicator. And basically, there's a little, there's a little flipper on the bottom that tells you um, uh, basically, the dial reads when the, little, when the little flipper moves. So it enables you to tell when things are perfectly concentric or perfectly circular or perfectly flat. The thing here is called a, a, a one-way multi-gauge, which is particularly nice for setting planar knife heights, checking router table uh, bit heights. This is a caliper on the right that tells you how long things are between these two teeth here. Now, this is a dust collection unit that's made out of a clear acrylic. And the really cool thing about that, it's similar to the Dyson vacuum in principle. Um, the Dyson vacuum kind of, it, it's, it's odd to say this, but it changed my world with respect to how I expect vacuum cleaners to work. And I think the most effective demo of a Dyson vacuum is to go into a room that you think is clean and then run the Dyson vacuum on the floor. And the cool thing about the Dyson is that there's this clear area here that you can see uh, when you're picking stuff up. So if you think the room's clean, you run the Dyson, you can actually see dirt forming inside this clear chamber. You know you're actually accomplishing work. 
And this is a, a big boy version of the same thing. This is the kind of machine that I collect that I connect to my table saw to collect the dust that my saw blade makes. Now my son is a, is a very athletic little boy, and he uses feedback tools like these when he plays baseball. This is a bat that has a very small head that he hits wiffle balls with. Um, if you can hit a small-headed bat, then hitting a, a larger-headed bat is easier. This is a glove that's flat. It has no pocket. So to catch correctly, you have to use both hands. So basically, these two tools make the game more difficult while you're practicing so that when you play the game on the field, the game becomes easier because you're using, uh, well, you've made it difficult during practice, so you've tuned yourself up to a higher level. And of course, here is a, is a radar gun that, that enables a, a person to see how fast he's throwing a baseball. So these are all tools that provide feedback to me that enable me to know whether the woodworking thing that I'm doing or the baseball thing that I'm doing is actually correct so I don't practice the wrong thing or build something wrong into my final work product. Now, the truth about feedback is that the longer your feedback loop, the worse the, uh, the, worse the process is going to be. And in fact, long feedback loops kill. And I'll give you a very simple example of that. Imagine if the feedback from touching this to your brain took 30 days. I mean, imagine how disfigured we would all be from, from making the mistake of touching and leaving your hand on this and not finding out, not experiencing the pain of touching this until a month later. I mean, how horrible would it be if our nervous system were so slow that, you know, we, we weren't even aware when we were touching something hot. So this seems like a really contrived, hokey example, but it basically just just illustrates the fact that the earlier you can, you can find and fix a defect, to find and fix an error, the better. Now the chart on the left is the chart that comes from Barry Bohm's 1981 book called Software Engineering Economics. And it shows how much more expensive it is to find a bug or find a defect in a piece of software later in a, in a software project. You can see along the horizontal axis the, the traditional phases of a, of a structured project. And you can see in the line how much more expensive it, it gets to fix an error. Now you might think, well, a line, that, that doesn't really ring a bell with me. Um, until you notice the vertical axis is, uh, is not linear. It's, it's logarithmic in scale. So basically if you plot this on a linear scale, this is the curve that people are accustomed to seeing on the right. And, and it shows the truth that if you find and fix an error in the requirements or design or early coding phase, it's much, much, much less expensive than if you catch it in the operational phase of a project. So the way that people have tended to do software projects over the last 30 or 40 years is this traditional design, bid, build type of, of uh, project architecture. Basically, um, this is the Frederick Taylor way of separating thinking from doing. And if you're building something for the 42nd time, it's, it's not a bad idea to have the design all laid out up front with the detailed instructions which have been debugged and tested through 41 prior projects before construction can begin. The problem is this method doesn't work as well when you're inventing something new. You know, if you're sending people into space or if you're writing a piece of code that nobody's ever written before, um, software development is almost always invention. And in invention-oriented projects, the architect-led design-build way of, of building projects tends to work a little better. It tends to, to reveal flaws up front, shorten the feedback loop, and, and cause you not to make mistakes that you don't realize for you know, maybe 300 days after your, uh, your mistake has been integrated into your project. So the top thing is what software developers refer to as big design up front. And again, I've got nothing against big design up front as long as your, your design can be fully tested before you implement it. The one on the bottom is what software people call incremental design. Now I'm going to warn you, in a minute I'm going to sneeze, but I think it's going to take us all by surprise when it happens. Now if you're interested in, in, in this kind of thinking, um, I presented a paper for Redgate not too long ago called My Case for Agile, and it's recorded and you can see an hour's worth of discussion on on, on various aspects of Agile software development methods um, that include notions of incremental design, rapid iteration, pair programming, test-first programming, and a couple of other things. Um, basically, the, the whole Agile notion is targeted, in, in my mind, it's really targeted upon two things. 
One is that oftentimes the problem with, with uh, a software development project is not so much that the code doesn't meet the specification, is that the specification doesn't meet the need. And if you're, you're aiming at a target that's different from the real bullseye of what the business needs, it causes, of course, projects to, to become derailed sometimes. There's an example in that paper. By the way, you can also download the paper at uh, methodr.com if you don't want to spend an hour listening to my voice uh, going through it. But basically, there's an example in the paper that talks about an incremental approach to building a piece of software in which you actually end up with something different from what you originally thought you needed. On the bottom picture here is a, is a picture of, of time progressing and, and people behind the, the curtain, behind closed doors, building software that consists of a red, a purple, a gold, and a brown component. But if we build a red component and release it and let people use it, and then build a purple component, and then build a gold component, sometimes we find out that, you know what, the purple thing sounded good on paper up front, but now that we've used this for a little while, I think the pink thing would be better for us. And if we have the pink thing, actually the pink and blue things are superior to the blue and gold things, or the old purple and gold things. So sometimes the project ends up looking quite different from what you thought you wanted it to be at first. On this page, I'm, I'm merely reminding you that there are several tools that I use in, in daily life. And the reason I use tools is because with tools I can do more. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, is show a couple of examples of tools that, uh, that, that, that I've built because we've needed them. And then I'll, I'll pass it back to James. He'll do the same, and then we'll open things up for questions and answers. So the story I told previously uh, was a profiling example, and I hope that I've motivated you to understand and believe that profiling is actually something important that a developer should do before releasing code into the wild. So the next question in an Oracle context that you should be thinking is this one. How do you then profile a business task running on an Oracle-based system? And the answer is really two simple steps, or at least they sound simple. Number one is you get the properly scoped trace files, maybe one, maybe more than one, that, uh, that reveal how your code has been spending its time. And then number two, you analyze those trace files. And of course, tools are, are helpful in both steps. So let me walk you through the tools that, that we have that I use to actually perform these two steps. So step one, get the properly scoped trace files. I use a product that, uh, that we have here at MethodR called MethodR Trace. We abbreviate it MR for MethodR. Mr. Trace is what we call it. And the problem that Mr. Trace solves is that the old way of getting properly scoped trace files looks like this. First, you have to add code to activate and deactivate the tracing. So you have to do a little bit of research and figure out, am I going to do an alter session call, or am I going to call DBMS support in the old days of Oracle 7 and 8, or am I going to use a DBMS monitor that's available in Oracle version 10? Whatever I do, I have to add some code to my code to activate and deactivate the tracing feature. Number two, for example, if I'm using SQL Developer, then I have to run the script. So I click the button that says run the, the stuff that's in my SQL Developer worksheet. Step three, then, is if I'm a developer and the, and the division of labor is such that a database administrator is a different person than me, then I have to contact that database administrator and I have to ask him or her to start doing some things for me in order to get my trace file. First step is I have to have that person connect to my Oracle instance because the second step is I need for that person to be able to query what is the value of the diagnostic dump destination directory to which my trace files that I, that I created in step one were written. Um, step three then for the DBA is I have to convince this person to connect to the instance's host operating system because then we're going to need to change directories to the directory where the trace file is being stored. Well, after that, we have to spend a few minutes figuring out which of the thousands of trace files that are in that directory is the one or are the many trace files that I've just generated. And this can typically start with an ls-lt command um, to show the most recently created files first, that, or, or the most recently created files of, of, of the directory. But then when I find out that, well, eight files have been created in the last uh, 15 minutes, that's the time it took for me to contact and come down the hall to talk to my DBA, now we actually probably have to use a tool like grep to figure out which of these files is mine. We might even end up opening up a couple in BI to figure out, hey, is this the SQL that you traced? Is, is this the file that you want? Or are there three files you want? Or are there six files or just the one? 
And then finally, we have to FTP the file from the host operating system on which the database instance is running back to me on my desktop or laptop where I'm doing my work, so then I can run the tool to do the analysis, which is step two. Well, then when I get back to my desk, I can open up that trace file. Well, with Mr. Trace, it really, it really collapses this, this big uh, list of steps into just two. First, I do the run script thing. I don't even have to add code to activate and deactivate tracing because Mr. Trace does that for me. Um, so I click the same run script button that I clicked over here on the left hand side in step two. And then the second step is open the trace file because Mr. Trace acquires it, acquires the right one, uh, puts it on my desktop or laptop and allows me to open it with any tool that I want. So it really simplifies your life. Basically if you're required to do the steps on the left in order, in order to profile your code, you're probably not going to profile your code. It's just, there's nothing too complicated about it, but it's just so irritating to have to go through all these steps that most people are not willing to do it. And when you are willing to do it, it's a 15 or 20 minute round trip. On the right hand side, it's a sub-second round trip. The feedback loop between writing code and seeing the profile is one or two seconds and it's no extra work. On the left, the feedback loop is just long enough that people tend to not volunteer to go through it. So they tend to release code into production without profiling it at all. Now the second step was to analyze the trace files. And we have some tools that we've created to do that as well as you might have guessed. The, the easiest one that we have to use is called the method R profiler. And the method R profiler actually takes the trace data that, that is created in the first step and it aggregates it into a, into a, a really nice format that a developer or a database administrator or a performance analyst can see very quickly how the time is being spent. Now here you can see that something I ran took 11.601 seconds and you can see exactly why that 11.601 seconds was consumed by a subroutine call from the Oracle database perspective. In the section, in the section near the bottom here, it was too tall to show the whole thing so I just showed the top part. But this section explains exact same 11.601 seconds. The total line at the bottom of the section still says 11.601. But it explains the time's consumption not in terms of subroutine calls, but in terms of the SQL that, uh, that, that, that was executed in the course of creating that 11.601 second response time. And here you can see that there's a hierarchical relationship among SQL statements. This insert is the parent of this select. It's the parent also of this update. It's the parent also of this select. And to be able to see the, the Oracle recursive SQL and a parent-child relationship with the SQL that you've written um, is a very helpful thing for the performance analyst to be able to know whether my system's configured properly to run the SQL that's required to run. Now, we have other tools as well for analyzing trace files, and I think this is a really kind of a cool example. Um, for those of you counting them, I'm almost done uh, going through the examples, uh, and we'll give the the reins back to James here shortly. Um, here is a profile created by a tool that, that's part of the Mr. Tools or Method R Tools package called Mr. Skew. And what it's showing here is that there was a 77,000 second long batch run. Now 77,000 seconds is approximately uh, 21 hours. And you can see here that the 77,148 seconds was, was dominated, 76.6% .6 of that time was consumed executing calls that Oracle has named DB file sequential read. It's basically single block read calls executed from the Oracle kernel to the Oracle or to the operating system underneath. Um, and you can see exactly uh, how many calls got issued, what the mean latency per call was, and most system um, storage area network administrators would see this 5900 zero, zero, um, and, and tell you that, that this is 5.9 milliseconds and tell you that this is a pretty good average latency for a single block read call on a, on a big EMC array, for example, or a NetApp array. Um, so most SAN administrators would look at this and cross their arms and smile and think, yeah, we're doing our jobs. But on the next page, I want to show you some, some more data that allows us to drill into this trace file more deeply than even the profiler would drill in. And I want to show you exactly what's going on here to, con to consume this 59,081 seconds of reading time. Now I want you to notice this 59,081 here, the blue number, is the same as the 59,081 here, which is the blue number on this page as well. But 
if, if I were to show you only this data and ask you the question, how much time do you think we would save if we could eliminate 5 million of these 10 million DB file sequential read calls? Well, a typical person would probably answer, well, I think I, if you get rid of half the calls, I could probably save you half the time. The assumption being that the mean latency is probably going to stay the same. And if this number drops from 5 million or from 10 million to 5 million, then this approximately 60,000 figure is probably going to drop to maybe 30,000. Well, the drill down data shows us something that's very interesting in this case. Um, you can see that the average latency is 5.9 milliseconds, but you can also see with the detail that I'm showing here, and this is also a Mr. Stew output, is that there were 9,346,059 calls that lasted between 10 microseconds and 100 microseconds. And all told, these 9.3 million calls only consumed a total of roughly 200 seconds. 199.445978 seconds were all it took to execute 9 million database calls. On the other hand, there were 17 calls that took more than 10 seconds apiece to execute. Imagine what our average would be if these 17 calls didn't exist. Well, we could actually recompute it if you wanted to. There were 7,308 calls that took longer than one second apiece to execute. And those 7,000 calls consumed 20,000 seconds. Now, 20,000 seconds is roughly five hours. So we spent five hours just doing 7,000 I.O. calls. We spent almost six hours doing 130,000 I.O. calls that lasted between 100 milliseconds and 1,000 milliseconds, or one second. So the question, what if we could eliminate 5 million I.O. calls? Well, it makes a big difference which 5 million we eliminate. If we eliminate the green ones, which represents 93% of our total call count, we're only going to save 0.3% of our total time. But if we eliminate the red ones, which is only 5% of the total calls we're making, then you could save 98.5% of your time. Now, if you're a developer getting ready to put your application into production, and this is your pre-production -perform, pre performance readiness test, there's information here you need to know. Um, first off, the SAN guy needs to figure out why in the world are we spending 46,000 seconds on calls that last longer than 100 milliseconds apiece. The developer also needs to figure out, though, is there any way I can make my application not need to do these 444,000 calls that are taking so long? It may be that these calls are all associated with one SQL statement that's really not necessary to run the way that it's running. So there's all sorts of information that we can get by shortening the feedback loop and seeing how our code is spending our time. Now, one more picture that I want to show you about profiles is very interesting, is if you, if you were able to diff or take deltas of profiles from your development environment into your integration testing environment, into your production environment, then diffing the profiles can actually give you a lot of information about the effectiveness of the, of the stage at which your code is. So for example, if your unit test profile is considerably different from your integration test profile, those profiles are telling you that this code is not going to scale under load. If the integration test profile differs uh, a lot from your production profiles, then it's that, that, that difference is telling you that your integration tests do not adequately, adequately model what's really happening in production. And you probably need to make your integration testing environment a little more sophisticated so that it is a better model of production. If your production environment and your development unit testing environment are significantly different, then you're actually shortening the feedback loop to allow the developer to see how the code that might have run really well and really quickly in unit testing um, doesn't do so well in production. And that helps developers learn how to make code that's more scalable when it is promoted up into the production environment. So to summarize what profiling and, and looking at performance data can do for us during the development process is it allows you to see where did my code spend my time. Equally important is where did my code not spend my time. You know, you may think like I did that the file colon colon backwards colon colon read line is the place where your code spending its time. I could have assumed that that was where my code spent its time and wasted a week writing a faster one. You know, I could have thought, oh my gosh, there's a linear scan here that if I just spend a day and a half turning it into a hash join instead of a, or a hash lookup 
instead of a linear lookup, maybe my code will be faster. Well, folks, you don't have to guess if you have the right tools to, to get the feedback for why your code is spending the time that it is. So you can see where your code spends time, where your code does not spend its time, because that's certainly a place you don't want to waste effort or, or make your code more complex. You can also see how long your code should run, because if you see that your code takes uh, 10 minutes to run, but, but 9 minutes and 37 seconds of that are wasted, then you can tell that your code should have run in 13 seconds. So profiling is also how you know your goal state. I mean, it's a very nervous time for a developer when he goes to a user and asks, how long do you expect my code is supposed to run? Well, a developer who profiles can actually tell the user, look, here are the limits. You know, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, and the fastest this thing I'm writing for you can run is 0.7 seconds. Maybe the answer is the fastest this thing can run is 10.7, 10.7 seconds. Um, you can know. You can know how long the thing should run by, by using a profiling tool. So to net this all out, the, the things that I've shown you so far um, are Mr. Trace, which is a zero-click trace file collector and manager for Oracle SQL Developer. The method our profiler is a tool that shows response times in color with directed drill down. Basically, you, you look for the red bold things and you drill into those, and that takes you very quickly to the place in your code that you need to spend the most time trying to understand why it takes so long. And then Mr. Tools is a set of flexible utilities for working with trace data that include the SKU analysis tool that I use to show you the, uh, the detailed call durations. Um, it contains other tools that allow you to do things like crop your trace data. If, if you have a trace file that, that you want to use to diagnose why did something take 10 seconds when you expected it to take one, but the trace file contains 49 seconds worth of data, well, one of the first things you have to do is figure out which 39 seconds do I need to get rid of before I begin my analysis. So Mr. Tools gives you tools to figure out which of that time is important, and it gives you a tool to crop out the time that's not. And then, of course, working with raw trace data is somewhat inconvenient. For example, the, uh, the time values are 13-digit integers inside of an Oracle trace file, and there's no really easy apparent mapping to go from that 13-digit number to the question, what time did this thing really happen? Um, so we've got utilities that, that allow you to convert quickly. Again, the whole goal of these tools is to shorten the feedback loop between you and knowing why your, your code took the time that it did. So the combination of these three tools go to make up this uh, uh, software package that we sell called the Method R Workbench. And if you're interested in that, um, I encourage you to hit the URL, uh, method-r.com. Um, James? The slide that takes us back to you is here, so uh, if you'll give us a moment, we'll switch screens back to James Murtaugh. Uh, he'll finish up the presentation part, and then we'll get on to questions and answers. Thanks, Carrie. Okay, so I hope that was a, a good introduction to the benefits of using tooling in uh, software development. I'm going to look at two case studies here where the Redgate schema compare for Oracle has improved the database development process for uh, these two organizations. So the first one is DRW Trading. It's a, a principal trading organization that's running Oracle on Linux. And the DBA team is led by Michelle Moucher, who's an Oracle Ace director. Uh, you may have joined into Michelle's webinar just before Christmas. Although we're talking about Michelle in a DBA context, I think if we look at the challenges that she faces and that her teams face, these are very much development challenges and challenges that would certainly that certainly developers face as well as, as DBAs in managing those. And she has three main challenges. The first one is validating what needs to be changed when rolling out code to production. The second one, creating scripts for these changes and to put them into source control. And then her third challenge is checking changes on vendor application upgrades. So as I mentioned, she uses Schema Compare for Oracle to assist in, in the process and to help overcome these three development challenges. So I've just switched over to Schema Compare for Oracle. I'm just going to bring up the entry screen. So I've already run a comparison here just to save a little bit of time. Uh, but as you enter the software, this, this is the first screen that you'd come to. And you can see we've got two, we're connected to two databases. 
Uh, so Michelle would use exactly the same way. She, if you remember before, her, her first challenge was, was looking at uh, validating changes between her test and her production as well, that changes to production. So the two databases that I've, that I've connected to, the first one here is, is a test instance, a widget test, and we've got widget live here as well. And we can see the database is highlighted, but you can also notice underneath database we've got something called a snapshot. So before I, I want to carry on, I want to bring you back to these challenges and to look at the, the third one. I know it, it seems a slightly back way to approach things, but, but hopefully it'll make sense in a moment. So Michelle's third challenge was checking changes on vendor application upgrades. And the saving to snapshot feature actually allows Michelle to save the structure of the vendor application schemas at any point in time. And she can then use this snapshot to form the basis of a comparison to her actual database environment before or after upgrading an application. Okay, so back to the first challenge, which you remember was validating what needs to be changed when rolling out code to production. So I'm going to cancel this, or we'll go through a brand new comparison, but when I run that comparison, this is the screen that I come to, so we can see really nicely, we've got a lovely side-by-side -side view of our two databases. We can look at we've got a number of different objects up here, and we can drill into the DDL, for each of these objects, but let's have a look at this particular one here. So we've got three objects that exist in both database environments, but they're different. So we've also got five objects that only exist within the test environment. So these would be new things, and we've got a view, we've got a table, some trigger, uh, and a package here as well. So these are the kind of things that the developers have been working on. Um, Michelle will be looking to push these across into production. And then there's a whole set of objects that are only in the, the live environment. So bring you back to the side-by-side the -side, uh, diff view. So we can click on any of these objects and we can really clearly and very easily see what these differences are. So for example, within this example here, we've got a, a price difference and we can see the difference in the position and scale between the test environment and our live environment. So once Michelle has, has seen what differences are, she then wants to create a script, and she wants to put that script into source control, and she wants to use that script to deploy the, these changes across. And I mean, this, is, this really is the software's trump card. Uh, all she has to do is select which objects she wants to deploy. Uh, we've got a number that I've already ticked here, and then click on the, the deployment wizard, and we get a, a little screen up here. You remember Michelle's interested in putting the script into source control, so we're going to select the second option, which is to create a deployment script. She does have the option to open this script in SQL Developer or another IDE, if she's using another IDE, we can just click on the change to change that there. But really quickly, if we click on next, Michelle's prompted to review any dependencies, and click on next again, and we have that deployment script. I mean, it's super quick, so we've, we've got the SQL here, all in the correct order. For me, I understand a little bit more if I look at the summary. It's in, in English for me. Uh, and if there are any warnings, Michelle can also review those warnings. There isn't in this particular instance, but, but any warnings will show up here. So once Michelle has generated the script, she can save the script off or copy the script to, script to clipboard to a clipboard and then she can put that into her source control system. So I think you agree that that's something that is, that is really cool and certainly the benefit that Michelle has seen from using Schema Compare for Oracle has led to more reliable releases for DRW uh, and saved Michelle and her team an awful lot of time <coughs> in both validating differences between environments using the side-by-side -side diff view and creating the script to push that into source control to deploy those exact changes. <clears throat> the second example that I have here is, is a company called T2 Systems. Uh, this is really interesting because it was actually the, the QA lady that first bought Schema Compare for Oracle 
uh, into T2 systems to save herself time checking that her environment was in sync with development. And you can imagine the way that, that she would do that is, is very similar by using the side-by-side the -side diff view. But since she's done that, Dave has, has also used, used that because as well as her development challenge, ensuring development and QA are in sync, there's also a number of customers on different versions of the product. So Dave rolled out Scheme Repair for Oracle to his entire development team. Uh, and They use it in a similar fashion to Michelle to actually generate the scripts and to use the tool to deploy these changes to update the customer's versions with the latest version of the, the application and of the database. So with the, the example of the, of the QA lady making sure that the QA and development are in sync, I'm just going to go back a couple of steps on this screen. I'm going to go back to this option here. And I'm actually going to let the tool do the deployment for me. So similar thing, we've got a wizard here. It's going to prompt us to review the dependencies. It's also going to prompt us to review the script. So although we're asking the tool to do the whole deployment for us, the tool doesn't assume that we're completely happy and we're completely comfortable that the SQL that it, that it, it has generated is accurate. I mean, we know it's accurate. We're, we're very confident. Uh, but you always have the option to review that script and also to save the script and to copy the script off as well. Once you've been using the tool for a while, as Dave and, and Michelle have, uh, they'll be pretty confident to, to hit the Deploy Now button. And that's going to Okay, so we've hit, hit a little error, which is, which is always great in a, in a live webinar. So let me just quickly go back. Uh, I'm just going to close this here. I'm just going to uncheck a couple of these. I'm just going to pass over to my, my colleague, Tom. Uh, Tom Harris is head of Oracle Tools. He might be able to give a little bit of an insight of why this could happen. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to explain what's happened there. Uh, I think that the sample hadn't actually been set up quite correctly, and so the terminology between test and live was in fact the wrong way around. And so what I've done is switched the direction, and so I'm actually pushing the changes in live into test. Uh, but I think that's just because the environments are set up the wrong way around. In fact, the error that we saw there was because we were trying to uh, change the precision of a column in the target environment uh, and, and, and that's simply not allowed. We needed to have the precision set at zero star, which was what it was set up for for the test environment. So reversing the direction has allowed us to proceed and hopefully we'll be able to see that the two environments uh, do get synchronized up correctly and this will allow James to carry on and explain uh, the case study. Uh, but we need to bear in mind that the, the scenario is exactly the same. Thank you, Tom. So we, what I wanted to highlight here, if you remember, there were a number of differences or, or objects that only existed in one uh, environment and objects that existed in both environments but were, were different. What we can see here, we've got a number now of identical objects. And scrolling down here, nothing is highlighted. So again, using the side-by-side -side diff view, we can really clearly see if there are any differences. Now that we've pushed changes across, we can see that these differences have been migrated. And this is the, this is the functionality of the tool that the QAD 
uh, would use to ensure that the environments are, are in sync. I just want to go back to one of the points that Carrie made just to finish off the, this part of the presentation. Uh, I'm aware that, that time's ticking on, you've probably got a, a lot of questions for Carrie and hopefully from, for myself as well. Uh, please don't fire any complicated questions about that, why that scenario happened. I hope Tom's explanation is good enough, but I mean, feel free to try out the tools and you, you can see them working within your own environment. But one thing that Carrie highlighted was the need to spot errors as early as possible within any development process. And that's certainly applicable to database development. If you imagine your whole team working on something uh, and you've used uh, more of a manual process to actually push the changes across, you can spend an awful lot of time trying to find uh, what's caused a particular error due to a, a deployment. Using this tool is just going to save you so much time using the side-by-side -side diff to troubleshoot and to find those errors. Uh, I mean, that's aside from obviously the obvious time uh, benefits in actually using the tool to, to create the deployment script. So the tool that I, I briefly showed there was Schema Compare for Oracle. Uh, and, I, and I hope that I've kind of explained why developers and DBAs use this particular tool to deploy changes, to compare instances of their database, and using the, the snapshot functionality to keep a record of their changes that they can go back to and they can compare off and they can also uh, apply and roll out those, those changes and revert back to a particular point in time. There is also command line functionality to enable continuous integration with the tools as well. Uh, schema Compare for Oracle is part of the deployment suite for Oracle and three tools within that, Schema Compare, Data Compare and Schema Doc. You can download a 14 day free trial from our website. I've got a URL here for Schema Compare which is redgate.com forward slash products forward slash Oracle development and forward slash Schema Compare for Oracle. Uh, it won't surprise you that to get to the other tools, it's changed the last bit to Deployment Suite for Oracle or Data Compare for Oracle or Schema Doc for Oracle. We, we certainly like to keep things nice and simple. Okay, so I hope that was a, a good introduction to our tools and, and show you some benefits. I'm now going to finish off by showing you the contact details for both Carrie and myself. So you can see we can contact Carrie by phone. Uh, or by email at carrymillsap at method-r.com. Please take some time out to visit Carrie's website or the Method R website, methodr.com, and follow Carrie on Twitter at Carrie Millsap. Got telephone numbers here for myself. I we'll have a US toll-free number as well as a UK and the rest of the world number. We're a UK-based company, uh, but we do have a, a sales office within the, the US as well, but these calls will be routed directly to myself. My email address is james.mercer at redgate.com. Uh, redgate.com is the website. Uh, and please check out allthingsoracle.com. I hope you'll find some really useful information on there. Uh, and it'll give you a chance to look at some of the experts and to interact with them on the content that they're putting up. And that's also been featured on All Things Oracle. And my Twitter handle is uh, at allthingsoracle.com. So please follow me there. Uh, and you'll hear a little bit more about webinars and other educational stuff that I'm doing. Okay, so I'm going to open up to questions now. Uh, I'm just going to quickly bring out the console and see if we've, we've got any questions already. But please feel free to type some questions into the question box, uh, either directed at Carrie or directed at myself. Okay, so I have a question here for Carrie from Suman Kumar. Thank you, Suman. This is regarding the feedback loop. Is it a good idea to run with profiling enabled in production? I think that um, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. But the, um, there, there needs to be some runtime operational control that you have over how much profiling takes place. Basically, it's a question of how much measurement intrusion effect, effect the profiling creates for you. If, if you've got a, a, a two-hour batch job and the difference between profiling that job and running a job without the profiling features turned on 
is say 10 seconds, then I would profile that thing every single time it ran. Um, because the, the profiling intrusion would be a very, very, very small percentage of the, the total load that the thing's going to take anyway. Now, if you're running uh, 3 million sales transactions through a system per day, and unprofiled they take 0.1 seconds, but profiled they take 0.15 seconds, then I would not profile every one of those every day. But what I would do as a developer is I would create it's it's the notion of performance as a feature, which we talked about in the instrumentation Why Bother talk a few weeks back also on Redgate. Um, I want as a feature the ability to know how long are the things taking that are running. So I, I at least want to collect start and end times for each of those, for every single one of those 3 million sales transactions that we do. And that's not that expensive to do. There, there are inexpensive ways that you can collect the time uh, at which these clicks happen and at which the clicks are fulfilled. But I probably don't want to collect Oracle Extended SQL Trace data for every single click. But I do probably want to collect Oracle Extended SQL Trace data for some of those clicks. For example, I might have a feature built into my application. I, I won't say it passively. I might build a feature into my application that enables an operational runtime administrator to select. Do I want to trace a tenth of a percent of these things, or, or do I want to trace 50% of these things when they run? Um, that's a knob I want to be able to turn when I'm an operational runtime administrator of the app. Because if the thing's running satisfactorily and everybody loves it, I may not want to trace more than you know 50 of these 3 million runs a day. But if it starts really behaving poorly, and I want to get to the bottom very quickly of why it's behaving poorly, I might turn that knob that says, you know, trace every one of these for the next five minutes. I want to see every single trace file for every book order that happens in the next five minutes. Well, I want to be able to do that. So that type of a feature is a thing that a developer needs to actually build into the application so that the runtime administrator has the ability to perform these diagnostic steps um, live and extremely quickly um, when in the live production environment time is of the essence. Thanks, Carrie. So there, there are no other questions in the, the question panel at the moment. Uh, and this is obviously a, a great opportunity to put some general Oracle development questions to Carrie whilst you, you're on the line and, and you have Carrie here uh, to answer them for you. So please do take this opportunity to put any development questions to Carrie. And just as I say that, we, we do have a, a question from Rafael uh, Rodriguez. Thank you, Rafael. As this again is to you, Carrie. How do we profile a new application where we do not have data in it? Well, one of the, one of the hardest problems is you, you run something in your unit test environment and it takes uh, 0 0.001 seconds, and that's because all of your you know, 62 tables in your join have, have 10 rows in them. Um, and, and as soon as you take that query to a, to a more realistic data set size, um, it might take 42 minutes to run because the, you know, the query that you wrote that ran fast with 10-row tables doesn't run fast at all with million-row tables. So there's a whole industry segment dedicated to generation of fake test data and things like that. It's, it's even a harder problem than that because it's not just the test data that's the problem. It's the test workload that competes with your run when it's running against that stuff. So, for example, not only do you maybe not have a million rows in your unit test environment to, to, uh, to drive the real execution plan that's going to happen in production, but you also don't have the 600 other users on the system at the same time as you who might be competing against you for locks and latches and other serialization devices inside the Oracle database kernel. So you may have literally performance bugs, or I'll say performance defects in your software and not know it until you get into an environment that has both realistic looking data and realistic looking workload. So in order to shorten the feedback loop, you really have to get your code into one of those environments as quickly, you know, I, I want to say as quickly as possible, but at least 
quickly enough that you still have time in your project to decide, what do I do to fix this if the, if the first test doesn't go well? Now, after you have an environment like that for a little while, you'll start to notice patterns that when you write queries in your 10 row, 10, 10 row test tables, you know, in your unit test environment, when you look at your execution plan for your SQL, and that's something that you should be in the habit of looking at as a developer of SQL, uh, SQL statements, you'll, you'll start to notice that certain uh, row source operations that show up in your execution plans correlate to code that doesn't scale really well when you move it up. So there are courses you can take, and we teach one, for example. We teach people how to write more efficient SQL and how to measure uh, where their SQL is taking time and how to rewrite their SQL or perhaps how to re-index or repartition their data and things like that. Um, once you get some experience with seeing how the code that you write behaves in a larger environment, you start to notice patterns in particular the execution plan for things to watch out for so that when even if you only have an, a, a unit test environment but you see a, a certain type of uh, row source operation pattern, it, it triggers your memory to say, you know what, I need to, I need to visit the SQL very carefully because when we move it up to the million row tables, this is the kind of thing that tends not to perform very well. And, and I don't know how to explain it other than to say it, it takes some training and it takes some experience, but the best experience begins with measuring things in unit tests and measuring them in some sort of uh, performance testing environment, even if that's in production. And that, that enables your brain to start making the, the correlations and start noticing the patterns that, that when you see them in unit tests, it, it triggers your attention to, to really focus on those things so that they don't cause the same kind of problems in production that, that you'll see if you actually measure in unit test in production. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, so the next question we have here again is from uh, Raphael, uh, and this is to do with Oracle Apex. Uh, I'm not sure what your experience is with Apex, Carrie. Well, I've got uh, Ron Crisco in the office with me here, who probably regrets my saying that. But uh, between the two of us, I think we can probably cover most things that that are getting ready to get asked. Fantastic. I only say that because I, I did notice there's a couple of. Uh, Apex guys in the audience, but the question from Raphael is uh, how do we go about the overhead in Oracle Apex? And the answer to that is the same as any other answer. It's uh, there are some things that are negotiable and some things that aren't. Uh, so if you've chosen a particular platform, then you're going to deal with the overhead of that platform. And if, if, if it's unacceptable, then your only choice is to pick a different platform. Uh, that said, I think that the overhead at Apex is well worth it for the ease of development and deployment that you gain. So it's, it's really a trade-off. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Raphael has said thank you there, so that certainly answered his, his question. Okay, so we're going to finish up here in a few minutes. If if we don't get any more questions, but again, I, I urge you, if you do have something that you'd like to put to Carrie, and also to, to Ron Crisco, who's part of uh, Method R as well, we've got two, I see, two very experienced Oracle developers here. Uh, okay, so both of our, our contact details are on the screen. So if you do think of anything after this session, and particularly when you're watching,